it's Lucy and Ellie from Roman Found and today we are continuing our Roman tour of North Wales. It's our biggest tour yet and we've already visited three incredible locations on our journey so far, but today we're getting even deeper into the Welsh landscape and accessing some of the more remote and breathtaking ancient sites Wales has to offer. So let's get into it! We are continuing our Roman tour at the furthest peak of Anglesey on the South Stack Cliffs, RSPB Nature Reserve. So here we are, two miles west of the town of Holyhead, on this incredible landscape. And it's not just rare puffins and guillemots to be found, there's a wealth of ancient activity in the area going back for thousands and thousands of years. So why is there all this ancient history here? Well, Holyhead has got like a really strong connection with Ireland. And in fact, the Holyhead Mountain, which is on this nature reserve, is the first bit of land that you will see when sailing from Dublin to Holyhead. And this trade route has been going on for ages, for literally thousands of years. And Irish stone axes are actually one of the very first examples of trade from Ireland to Holyhead that you can find. Upon arrival, we thought we were what, going on a 10 minute walk. But it actually turned into be more like a more like a two hour hike, I believe it was in the end. Hiking around this ancient landscape, getting enveloped in the ruins that are around us and really seeing what our ancestors would have seen looking out to the sea towards Ireland. So the site is open till about 4 p.m. I think after that it's probably a bit dangerous. Yeah, it's really quite craggy and there's lots of rubble around, lots of it which is from the Iron Age Hillfort settlement but it's still easy to trip, trip over. I recommend good footwear. <laughs> Definitely, good footwear is needed, maybe a bottle of water, potentially a backpack. We did see people with hiking poles which I felt like I needed one of those because some of it is quite a steep climb as well. Yeah, we weren't prepared for the hike. No. Uh, we didn't know we were going on such a big hike. No, we, we had no idea that it was actually a mountain. Like, they do call it Holyhead Mountain for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> that was unapparent to us. <laughs> Completely unbeknown. So the whole landscape here is covered in ancient history. There's an Iron Age hill fort which encloses like something crazy like 16 hectare acres across the whole site. Everywhere we go we're basically within the hill fort, you can't not be. Then we've got these hut settlements which date back to the late Neolithic era as well as World War II watchtowers because it was such an, such an incredible vantage point and that's quite a large reason why the Romans came here as well because at the time that the Romans were taking Anglesey but the Irish sea raiders would come and the Romans wanted to protect the land from them and they were like pirates yeah and from this vantage point you really do have like a 360 degree view of like the whole area and what they have discovered on the summit of the Holyhead Mountain is they found the remains of a late Roman watchtower, which is actually one of the only examples to exist in Europe, and it's the foundations that they have discovered. And this tower would have stood on the summit of Holyhead Mountain and watched out for these Irish sea raiders coming across from Dublin, and then it would have lit a huge, like, t a burning torch, which would have signalled down, and it actually would have signalled down to the small fortlet that we visited in our previous video, Kaya Gubby. And then they would have seen this and signalled on to the much larger fort, which we are actually going to next, Sagontium, the largest Roman fort in North Wales. And this is the one that really controlled all of the comings and goings and what happened around North Wales. So where we're actually walking towards is the Celtic Hill Fort on Holyhead Mountain. Yeah, and this is largely what much of the rubble that you can see around us is from, because they would have had large and circular walls which would have basically defined the area of their hill fort and this is also the reason why the romans really wanted anglesey because it seems a bit strange that they would want this this little rough remote isle that's off the coast of north wales like yes it has really good trade routes with ireland which have been going on for thousands of years and it's got a couple of i think copper and silver mines here as well but despite all of these resources it's actually where they face the most fiercest resistance much like you can see by this huge hill fort is a celtic and a druid stronghold. But the fact that it is a stronghold is actually why the Romans wanted it, simply because they wanted to erase this conflict against them. And for them, Druids especially were something that was very alien to them and they simply just wanted it gone because it was so different to what their religion was and what they stood for. Druids, you see, they have this very strong connection to nature and you can see here in this outstanding area of natural beauty that this was a really sacred and important site for them. In fact, Anglesey as a whole is where they would have brought up the next generation of Druidic priests 
and they would have done all of their worship here and they would have taught the Druid religion here. The ancient and spiritual connection that you have with the landscape, it really felt like a pilgrimage for us climbing up this mountain. You can like even just feel even today that this is a special place and that you can understand why. I would have had such this important spiritual connection to these ancient people. So you feel very connected to Mother Nature, don't you? Yeah, it's like quite hard to describe. So I think it's definitely somewhere where you almost have to experience it for yourself. Yeah, and it's certainly important to get up and close and personal with this ancient landscape just to really understand like, what they experience and the problems that they face. And... Yeah, it's quite a challenging landscape and the wind as well, like the elements, you're so exposed there and just to think people are living on this headland is quite incredible knowing how like wild it is, like it hasn't changed for thousands of years. It feels rugged, it feels wind-torn, and it feels exactly like we're experiencing what they would have experienced. Yeah, and I think that's what makes it so special, is that it really feels like you're going back in time, wandering across this headland. How it is so sensory, it like almost like heightens the experience that you're feeling. It's almost like you're going into a whole other like, headspace being in this place. It's like going into a different world. It's like entering a new planet, it's like entering a new timeline. It's, it's all of that wrapped up in one. Yeah, it's like the elements are... The elements are against us almost as much as the Celts and the Druids would have been against the Romans coming into Anglesey. And even the landscape, like you don't want to trip and fall down this mountain either. Oh, I mean, I'm surprised they even managed to build a tower here without it being blown <laughs> off the mountain. Like the wind was quite insane. I remember when we were coming off just being deafened by the wind and like we were shouting at each other because we could hardly hear each other. Yeah, it's a really like full sensory experience. It is, it's a full sensory ancient history experience and it's one we would certainly recommend if you ever find yourself in Anglesey. We'd love to stay up there all day. We really needed to get back, find out where we we're staying and get some food. And quite handily, while I plugged in the, uh, the Airbnb location that we had booked for the night, it was a three minute drive away. Turns out we're staying, basically camping, probably where the Romans have camped, on the slopes of the Holyhead Mountain. I know, I can't believe that it was quite a... I had no idea when I booked it. Bit spooky. Bit of spooky coincidence. That was the spiritual awareness all happening there, <laughs> yeah. right there and then. We stayed in this beautiful little Airbnb with a wonderful sea view. To definitely recommend a good price. Yeah, lovely price. Clean. clean, accommodating. And we were actually made it in time to go to the local fish and chip shop for a very important dinner. Yeah, it was our post hike tree. Literally the only meal we'd had that day. It was all a bit full on, wasn't it? Was it was all a bit full on. I think we travelled like something crazy, like 500 miles in the day. It was a bit, a bit of sea. But I'm looking forward to tomorrow because that is when we go and visit some of, some of the more incredible ancient sites that we're going to go and see. So waking up on the slopes of the Holyhead Mountain, we're preparing ourselves to go off on our journey, the same journey that the signal would have taken from the summit of the Holyhead Mountain all the way to the Fort of Sagontium which is the largest fort in Roman North Wales and one of the most important forts in the military network of this area. So from Holyhead, we're about a 40 minute drive from Carnarthen. Yes, and Carnarthen is the site of Sagontium. It was built in 80 AD and is the one that was occupied for the longest. They occupied this all the way up to the end of Roman Britain, which is very unusual and it's the only one in North Wales that was lived in for so long because it was so important. And it is actually very much in the middle of Carnarthen, isn't it? I mean, I was quite surprised at where it was located. Just basically in another housing estate. Essentially, we were just driving around and suddenly it was like, oh, the sat was like, you're here! And I was like, are we? Are we here? We're like in the middle of these like normal civilian streets. I was expecting to go out to some kind of like you, I was desolate location. Yeah, and to be a bit more remote. But no, instead it's like slap bang, there's like three Georgian houses in the middle of the fort that they can't excavate because <laughs> there's like people living in them. And it's one of the most incredible, I think, Roman sites that I've been to. There's so much of it revealed. And it is a wonderful park. Which oh, beautiful. Is just accessible. Easily accessible. There's a nice sign, points to Sagontium, one of the classic brown signs, which just makes it quite easy to see. We parked on the road, free parking, went into this park, and there's so much of the foundations of the barracks and like all of the important military buildings. Everything's basically there to go and see. You can wander around. And it's all quite beautifully excavated, isn't it? Yeah, the scale of it is quite... It's like crazy. jaw-dropping. I don't think I've been in a bigger Roman fort. We started the tour 
at a small site, the yeah. bathhouse, but this is just sort of on another scale. Oh, completely. The bathhouse in Prostatin we started at was just one building of one Roman fort. This is all of the buildings of one Roman fort, not just any Roman fort, but the biggest Roman fort in North Wales. So why was this fort site occupied for so long? Well, the reason that the fort site was occupied so long is actually largely connected to where we have just been up at the Holyhead Mountain in Anglesey. This is the fort that controlled all of the troops' movements and it was basically like the administrative centre for the Roman network in North Wales. And it was designed to look over the Isle of Anglesey, to watch it, to protect it and to defend it from the Irish sea raiders that the watchtower up at Holyhead Mountain was designed to look out for. But they needed to protect Anglesey so much because Anglesey is very different to everywhere else in North Wales. The rest of North Wales is mountainous, it's hilly, it's rocky, whereas Anglesey is fertile, it's got copper and silver on there which they're mining. It's an incredibly important resource for the Romans, so they need to protect it and that's why this fort is here and that's why it's so big and it's so important. So this fort would have had four gates on either side. Yeah, and you can actually see where these gatehouses would have been in the foundations, which was quite incredible. And we had fun spotting them out, didn't we? But you can clearly see where the gate would have been. They would have had the towers, which would have gone alongside the gate as part of the defence system of the fort. So I actually walked through the gate and then I turned to the right. And if you go a little bit further down, you can actually see the remains of a Roman wall. Yeah, and what we loved the most about this Roman wall was that you can see the post holes in it, which are from the original timber scaffolding of the Roman construction of it, which is incredible to see the building techniques of the time. Yeah, and it's quite a substantial bit that's still standing there. So much of what you can see is, was actually uncovered in the original 1920 and 1923 excavations which were undertaken by the archaeologist R.E.M. Wheeler, who was part of the National Museum of Wales. But there was a further excavation taken in the 1970s, which revealed a lot of the timber barrack blocks, which would have been part of this huge fort. And then also the rest of the buildings around, which kind of like make up the massive forts we've gone to. So Lucy, do you remember when we were looking around and we saw that funky bit that looked like a little bathhouse? Oh yeah. yeah. Is it, was you it remember? the bit that had the... The semicircle bits in it. Next to the hedge, where the houses are. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, do you remember that bit? And do you remember discussing at the time when we were like, why is there like this weird small bath? <laughs> like, we were like, it's like a small version of Prostata. What is it? What's it yeah, doing yeah. here? Well, I was actually doing some reading and I have discovered that this is part of this huge courtyard house, which basically like an important official would have had, mm. who had their own personal small bath house inside it. No, so it's like a private bath house. It's like a bougie bath house for this like incredibly important Roman official. How cool is that? It took us a little bit of time to notice, but that there are little plaques around the site that are carved into stone and sort of label what these buildings are. Yeah, and they're almost embedded into the foundations themselves. And we spotted them. There's a couple of barracks which are nicely labelled and things, aren't there? And we actually know the name of one of the garrisons that would have stayed there. We do? Yeah, and do you know why we know it? Why? So we know it because when they did the excavations of this place, they uncovered this inscription which re recorded the repair of the fort's actual own personal aqueduct, so it was that bougie, it had its own aqueduct, so they had to repair it and it recorded the name of the garrison who was stationed there at the time and who undertook these repairs, which was the first cohort of Sunichi, which was a 500 strong infantry regiment which would have originally come from Germany. So these wow. people have travelled far and they've come all the way to Sagontium in North Wales. We're actually quite lucky that we can still see the foundations here. And do you know why that is, Lucy? Something about building a castle. Yeah, so Edward I decided that all of this stone trapped in these foundations at Sagontium was perfect for the building of his brand new castle that he wanted to build here at Carnarfon. And he actually pillaged loads of the stone from this fort, which is part of what builds this castle at Carnarfon. So it's shocking that there still is something here after all this medieval pillaging. Use they, that Roman stone. They love to recycle the Roman stones. So there used to be a museum here at Carnarfon, which was the Sagontium Museum, which would have had loads of the artefacts and stuff uncovered during the excavations. But sadly, this museum is no longer and it's now shut. But they also would have had these stones, which were actually found from our next place, Tom and Muir. What stones? They were like these, these cool little carved stones, which were found at this later castle site which detailed the construction of Domini Muir which is this small little rural outpost we're about to go and visit in the Snowdonia region of North Wales. 
If you're liking our digging adventures, please remember to hit that subscribe button and follow our channel. So from Sagontium, which is basically in the middle of a city, we've got a 30 or 40 minute drive out into like rural Wales. The steps. The mountains. We're going into the Snowdonia National Park and to go and visit Tormenimir, which is a Roman fort and possibly the most isolated Roman fort in North Wales. It's this lonely outpost with a view of the Snowdon Mountain and it's going to be quite an adventure I feel. So the landscape really changes as you drive away from Anglesey. Oh it does, it completely changes and it really makes me wonder what these Roman legions were thinking as they're marching through and building their roads across this like strange and ever-changing landscape that is North Wales. So this is probably one of the harder sites to find and we definitely had trouble with the set nav. Oh you guys are certainly lucky that we even found this site in this part of the video because it was almost impossible to track down the location of. And then the parking was a nightmare wasn't it? Well on our first attempt we went down this dirt road, which is where it is, but we ended up driving straight past it because we didn't know where to park. We had to loop back round. A mountain. We had to go around a mountain to come back round onto the main road again. And then parked off the main road. There's like a... Handily, there's a big lay-by at the bottom of the track which leads up to Tom and Muir, which was quite handy for parking in at least. A bit of free parking. And from a car, you turn left, you walk under a bridge, and then up this really narrow, rugged road. <laughs> but it's beautiful, there's lots of nature to see while you're on this walk. Oh, I feel like it's beautiful Snowdonia landscape, like it's, it's peak Wales. But still, it was yet another, I would say, unexpected hike. Yeah, about a 20 minute hike up to the side. Yeah. And you do have to be a little bit careful because it's quite a narrow little road that there's a lot of surprisingly a lot of traffic on there. There's quite a few farms dotted about up the road. Expect to see people. So the parking is an issue. And then what else is an issue is the lack of signs pointing you in the right direction going up the road. Oh yeah. And even on Google the Maps. Google Maps it's Ordnance not Survey not Maps. Really marked. No, there's no easy route to get there because it is so rural. You kind of have to like Path. and we did go over the wrong start to begin with, didn't we? Yeah, so when you're walking up this road, you'll come across a few houses, you go around a few corners, then you'll see a sty. On your right. Don't go over it. That takes you nowhere near it. Do not go over that. You've got to keep, keep going, on going. Keep going. Keep going. And what you're looking for is like a, there's like a cattle grid in the road and a yeah. gate, and to the right of that is the gateway through to the, the mound and you can see it, you can see where you need to go, yeah. it's just getting to the, I guess the, 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 the access way to the field. Because there is only really one way in and one way out and it is this gate that's in front of this cattle grid. But the other side of the cattle grid as well is actually, that's the conjunction of four Roman roads which goes through the Snowdonia National Park, which is why this fort was built here. So from our research, we thought there was going to be signage here. Oh, we were expecting, there used to be like big plaques, like quite information boards, which would tell you all about the more unusual parts of the site, because it's quite a really rare example within the Roman Wales history. And it's got some fascinating features to it, but they're no longer signposted. So we had to do all of our own research as normal. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where they've gone. No, Are I'm they sure. redoing them? Do they just not want them there anymore? Do they not want people to find this site? I'm not quite sure why <laughs> they've disappeared. A, there's a whole little story there, I think. Yeah, a whole little story that we're missing. So why was this outpost built here? Well, it is quite strange because it's so remote and I actually think it might be one of the remotest positions that a Roman legionnaire could have been stationed on in North Wales, which is why it's got some of the more interesting features that you don't see in other outposts. Like, for example, it has a really rare example of a military amphitheatre, which can just be seen made out in some of the earthworks of the site. And they actually reckon that this was built just to entertain the troops, almost like a sorry we've put you here in this like really <laughs> boring, really remote location where you're not going to see like any other civilization. So just to keep them occupied and a bit of entertainment. Yeah, a bit of entertainment for them just because it was just so barren. But it was actually built here in the first place. There was a particular Celtic tribe, the Ordovici's tribe, which was causing real trouble in this area and on this main Roman highway that it's protecting. So they had to station this garrison here to kind of like squash this uprising and like keep this tribe back. So one of the interesting features of this site is this, the bit of fort wall that's been reconstructed, because that's, that's a really cool part of the history. So they've reconstructed what the fort wall would have looked like, second century stone wall. 
But this was built, what, in the... Was it um, 1900s, 1800s? Yeah, yeah, yeah. After the Second World War, you see. Oh, as late as that? Yeah, because what happened was the Second World War, randomly, in this very remote area of Wales, an ordinance hits... Well, some of the Roman foundations that are left on this site and like scatters it across everywhere. So what they do after the war is they use the Roman stone to build a reconstruction of what the wall would have looked like. Sort of creating their own bit of history. Creating their own bit of history based on like some archaeological digs and stuff of what the forts would have looked like at the time. They've built this wall for people to come and see whilst visiting. To help give you an idea of the impression of the site, because a yeah. lot of it is mainly earthworks. And from the location, we're sort of within a valley, but we're still on a bit of a rise. It's a bit of a sort of plateau within the valley. And you do get a really good vantage point from here, sort of across this whole area. Oh, you can. You can see Snowdon in the distance. You've got a really good view across the, all of the different mountains, everything. I feel like you could really see if something was coming towards you, if something was coming to attack this area. It's a really good vantage point. So originally the fort would have been timber, as with all of the Roman forts in Wales, but this was one of the rarer ones that was chosen in the second century to be rebuilt in stone, just because it was quite an important outpost because of the uprising at the time. But there's not much of this stone left, is there? No. There's not too much. There's the reconstructed wall you can see and some other walls that remain defining the site. But what would have been here would have been a bathhouse, a parade ground, burial grounds, there would have been against the really rare military amphitheatre, and also a house for visiting officials to come when they come and visited the legion, the poor legion that was stationed in this <laughs> lonely outpost here up in Snowdonia. So it really was quite a sophisticated site. Oh, it was quite a large and important military fort, although it was abandoned at 150 AD, so only after really a hundred years of use it was no longer needed, and they just, again with most outposts, abandoned them, left them to be reclaimed by the natural landscape, and the garrisons were shipped off to Hadrian's Wall, which was where the more important campaign was happening. So the main feature that you can see on the site isn't actually Roman at all. No, it's this, it's this mound, which is actually what they reckon is part of a Mott and Bailey castle. So it would have been built much later. So it just shows the site has been strategic for well, centuries. Se yeah, and for several civilizations. And this, they, one of the reasons that they reckon this Mott and Bailey castle was built is not too dissimilar to why the original Roman fort was built here in the first place because we have the time of William II, where there were, again, Welsh uprisings in this region. So the second part of our tour has really got a strong emphasis on the Welsh landscape. Oh, and very much on how the Romans would have coped with this landscape that they've come into, a lot of which was hostile towards them, a lot of which was very remote, and how they would have controlled the whole network that we've been uncovering across North Wales on our journey. To conclude our journey, we decided to follow one of the Roman roads to Hedwin's Cottage, which is a really important part of Welsh rural history around the First World War. And they've got a great cafe there, so I think we're going to have a nice cup of coffee. The Roman road goes right through the farm. Right through the farm, and it's a route that the troops probably would have walked all the way up here to Tomini Muir, where they would have been stationed at their very lonely outpost. But it's the perfect place for us to grab a cup of tea and just... Soak in all of this amazing landscape that we've witnessed on the second part of the tour, and just like really envision. Roman Britain in Wales. And I feel like the whole adventure, particularly on the second day, has been really life-changing. It has, and it's been quite wild, and we've been very connected with the land. And it's just been, I need to just sit in the land and encompass it. Yeah, it's been a magical experience. We're going to emerge from the mountains and change people. We haven't had phone reception here for at least four hours. Yeah, that's another thing which makes finding these locations a little bit more challenging as the lack of phone signal. Signal. So it is really like being in the Roman times. <laughs> you get you're going back to your roots. Using the mountains for guidance. And Not re getting reading, my stars. Reading the landscape to figure out where <laughs> on earth you're going. So if you've enjoyed this half of our Roman tour, then you have to make sure you've seen part one, because all of these Roman sites are so interwoven that they really create the story that is the Roman occupation of North Wales. And if you've seen part one, then check out our other Roman tours across Great Britain. And of course, feel free to leave us a suggestion on where you want the Roman tours to go next. Thanks for watching. If you're feeling inspired and want to get out digging, then we've got a 10% discount code off at LP Metal Detecting, so treat yourself to some new gear. 
the links in the description.